Welcome everyone to Bitcoin Magazine's Meet the Taco Plebs. My name is Casey Carrillo, and today I have another contributor here at the magazine with us. Uh, he goes by Nameless, and if you haven't checked out his articles, I highly, rec highly recommend doing so. Uh, Nameless, if you want to just introduce yourself real quick. Hi, I'm Nameless. Uh, like Casey said, I've been floating around Bitcoin Twitter for maybe four or five months now. Um, enjoying it, um, getting to know some people, uh, finding my way into a lot of content that way, which is nice. Um, learning a lot, enjoying myself and just kind of figuring out uh, as we go, like everybody else. Right. Um, well, you're helping people figure things out because your articles are, are quite interesting the way you break down uh, some of the more complicated aspects of Bitcoin in a general way. But um, before we get into that, I just want to ask you, uh, how did you get into Bitcoin? What's your rabbit hole story? Uh, my story is pretty stereotypical for the most part. Um, my first, I first heard about it in all-time high of 17. I bought it. I think 17,000 as it was coming back down and I kept buying. I don't remember my reasoning for this or like why I had such conviction. It was probably naive in retrospect, uh, but I kept buying and it kept going down. And I was like, that's strange. It's supposed to continue going up. Um, I think I first heard about it, probably some uh, Reddit Bitcoin post that made it to like the top of all or something or the front page, at least. Um, I don't remember exactly, but so, yeah, so I bought a bunch on Coinbase, like most people and panic sold a bunch of times panic bought a bunch of times had no idea how it really worked for a while um bought all the way down to 3k and i guess really during that time i started uh reading about it like very superficially and that was like a very gradual process for me reading all the like philosophical stuff and um like the economic side of it and it wasn't until probably six or eight months ago when i really got knee deep in uh, the protocol itself, like the technicals, the math and stuff like that, um, which has been like particularly up my alley. So very stereotypical story, but yeah. Yeah, uh, stereotypical, but at the same time, uh, I find that there's like a reason that th such a trend happens where people, they start buying and selling on, uh, you know, whatever exchange they're using, uh, mostly out of speculation or, oh, the number goes up and uh, they sell when it goes down, et cetera. And then as soon as you start diving into the more deep aspects of Bitcoin, uh, your conviction level changes, the way you trade or hodl changes and uh, yeah, it changes your whole, your whole representation of Bitcoin. But beyond that, um, I want to ask you, how has Bitcoin changed your life? Because as we come into understanding of this, uh, um, you know, thing, we often change the way we perceive value, um, you know, parts of our lives that we didn't really think about before. So how, do, how has Bitcoin changed your life? Uh, so I'm probably in a, like a large majority of people who have um, a college degree, went into uh, some debt for that in the form of student loans or whatnot, and um, had trouble getting a job in that field directly and subsequently took uh, like a similar, but not quite the same job title uh, for less money than they expected. So with that as the backdrop, then uh, we have economic turmoil from last year and general inflation and ever increasing cost of housing and consumer goods and things like, th and things like that. It becomes obvious at a certain point, which unfortunately is a little too late for a lot of people. But if you're lucky, you realize at some point that you need some type of um, way out or a life raft so that you're not like perpetually underwater or behind the eight ball. Um, and I think it all kind of coalesced for me when I realized that Bitcoin would probably be the most feasible option for that for me. Like I'm too late to get in on the uh, uh, meme stock hype train. I missed GameStop and AMC and all of that stuff. I wasn't really paying attention. Um, I can't afford a house. I missed that pump. Um, whether or not I'll be ever ever, ever be able to afford like uh, you know a, a family sized house is is up for debate. I guess it's really dependent on a lot of other things. But um, but yeah, it seems like the the only way to preserve my my wealth and, and my time, like all the effort that I put in. 
um, given that our money is constantly being debased. So a way out. Yep. Uh, and that's so common. People who, you know, go through the motions, get educated, go to college and are searching for the job that they want and they can't find it. And assets become further out of their reach as time goes on. And uh, it, it's a very common story. Um, and at least Bitcoin is here for uh, all of us to kind of find this way out, like you said, in a kind of an escape hatch. Um, so some of the things you do really well for us here at the magazine is break down these complicated concepts uh, for our readers to understand pretty easily. Uh, I want to ask you about your process for writing articles like that. How do you how do you take these technical concepts and break them down? Uh this might sound like an anti-answer, but I don't really know what I'm going to write until I, well, I, I should say, I don't really know how I'm going to write something until I start writing it. So I have to like miss the target before I can kind of figure out where I am in relation to it, if that makes sense. Um, so for example, I wanted to, when I wrote the piece about what miners are actually doing, technically speaking, um, I wrote down what I thought I knew. And, and like maybe like a sort of a form of a bulleted list. And I went through um, each of those and tried to figure out uh, very specifically whether or not that's correct or to what degree it's correct, if it's, you know, somewhat uh, subjective and going from there. And then at that point, once it's, you know, reasonably fleshed out, I'm, it's a matter of like organizing things so that it makes sense that one thing is following another. Um, and like every, every time someone hears that I have a math degree, they assume I'm like wicked intelligent, which isn't at all the case. I'm like perfectly middle of the bell curve, which I think suits me for technical writing because I can appreciate how the average person is probably not going to immediately understand elliptic curve cryptography because I don't even immediately understand it. The difference is like I have a passion for math. And so I'm willing to like spend that time to like chew it up, unravel it and lay it out in like a reasonable fashion. Um, so I felt like that's kind of a niche that I, that I fell into pretty easily, um, having at least a little bit of a background. Uh, but it, it usually just ends up me throwing a bunch of stuff at a page and kind of like unwrapping it and, and whittling it down a little bit. But there's, there's obviously no shortage of, of research and trying to figure out like if things are conflicting, why are they conflicting is just, um, yeah. That was a fantastic answer. I mean, uh, mostly because I am very much the same type of writer where I start and then I figure things out uh, as I go along. Um, but I think that's kind of, uh, you know, the way you get things done if you're sort of throwing darts at a dartboard. But your your articles have been fantastic. Um, we've got some, like you said, about mining. Uh, you had one, uh, an overview of Bitcoin's cryptography. Uh, you talked about Bitcoin's game theory in one of them. And most recently, uh, you introduced us to the Lightning Network. So uh, I encourage anyone listening, uh, if you haven't gone and read uh, Nameless's uh, articles, go and check those out because they are quite effective at taking uh, these concepts and, and making it easy to understand. So uh, moving on from here, Nameless, I want to ask you what you're most excited about in the Bitcoin space because there is so much going on right now. It is. And I find it a little overwhelming and difficult to try and keep up with it all being a dev mailing list, telegram groups, uh, Bitcoin groups and pages or Twitter pages and all this other stuff. It's it's hard to keep up with it. Um, there's so much of it, but I, I, I'm glad for that. I'm glad there's a lot of like very, very much of a flurry of activity surrounding it. But right now um, I've been reading a lot about Lightning Network, just because it's, it's, I think it's kind of on the forefront of a lot of people's minds with El Salvador's adoption coming up and it being like, as of right now, as far as I know, like the most feasible vehicle for mass adoption, which is arguably what we're all here for at the end of the day. Um, so that's been really cool. In particular, uh, reading about uh, routing algorithms and how, how nodes determine which, um, routing nodes to pass transactions through and how that can be optimized, profited from like the, the economic competition that comes from being a, um, a routing node and fee setting and all this stuff that uh, so like frequently talked about in um, the Lightning Friday uh, Twitter spaces is really cool. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what's got me excited um, right now. Lightning is, is I think is 
very, very simple and uh, exceedingly clever. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I mean, lightning is blowing up right now in terms of popularity and adoption and usage. And even our, our very own company right now, uh, we've got people within our company saying, you know, we really need to toot the horn on lightning because as you said, it really is the most feasible way forward for mass adoption. Um, and, and lightning appears to be the way forward for hyper Bitcoinization, um, you know, totally gets rid of the scalability FUD and, uh, really brings when, when you see the instantaneousness of the transactions and the way the lightning network works in person, it blows your mind. And uh, you understand very quickly that this is the future. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Lightning is absolutely the most exciting thing going on right now. Um, but as serious as this is, we do have to ask a bit of a ridiculous question that I like to, to ask everyone because Price predictions are always so fun, and it lets you know like how someone sees Bitcoin uh, going forward. So I want to ask you about your price prediction for the end of this year, as well as for the end of 2030, which does seem a ways off. But So 2030, okay, that's a little less than a decade. Okay, by end of year, um, shall I just give you the answer or give you the answer and like kind of preface or give some context as to like justification? No, you can give context. That's That's cool too. Okay, I'll give you a price. End of year, I'm gonna say probably between uh, seventy and eighty thousand. And like, I'm by no means a TA guy. I I generally uh, avoid charts like the plague because uh, I'm not a trader and I'm in it for the next fifty years, so it doesn't super duper matter uh, for me at least. Um, but my reasoning is that I guess basically anecdotally is seems to be like the whole four year, four year cycle being uh, like very coherent and easily identifiable seems to be coming uh, less so uh, to some degree or another. And um, it's like now the Bitcoins and the zeitgeist, like the, the dynamic of the whole thing is uh, changed, I think non negligibly. And so I think that like now that a lot of more people have eyes on it, like I think like ex absolute extreme run ups are going to be more dampened and like very, very extreme dips are going to be more dampened as well. Uh, so I think it's just going to become relatively more muted. And I think it will just kind of be basically a slow grind upward, relatively speaking, compared to like 2017 and things like that. Totally. And, and uh, this, how about 2030? Oh, nine years, eight and a half years away. Um, I would, I would probably say I'm, I'm going to get so much response on this and none of it's going to be good. I'm going to say probably half a million. Oh, okay. Ba Maybe. Bearish, not going to lie. Bearish yeah. relative to most, <laughs> exactly. most people whom I ask, you know, they say, oh, there's no price that could even represent. But so explain 500K. Why do you think so? I just think like, I guess I'll fall back on my previous justification for, for 70 to 90K as well, which mm -hmm. is that I think it's, I think there's going to be a lot more money in the space. And so it'll be more dampened and um, probably more regulation around for better or worse, probably worse in most people's opinion, mine included. Um, I don't know. It's like, I'm, I'm like the last possible person you should really ask because <laughs> I don't look at charts and I don't compare cycles and like uh, stock to flow. I have, I've never really looked at and, and things like that. It's just, it's honestly, that's me just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. And like, that's where it landed a little bit. That's okay. Cause everyone has a price prediction, no matter what uh, they, their part in Bitcoin is. And uh, I just love asking people. And especially when I get uh, an answer, that's not just ridiculously bullish because as fun as that is, it's almost more of a challenge to try and maintain some level of reality uh, yeah. to your answer. So uh, we, uh, I really appreciate you coming on nameless. Uh, I love the contributions you've given us here at the magazine. As I said before, I highly encourage anyone listening to go check them out. Um, Thank but you. thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. All right, everyone. Uh, check out the next episode um, and be sure to read Bitcoin Magazine. Take care. Bye.